At this time, Lisa Young will take a roll call to see if a quorum is present. For members attending in person, please turn on your microphones when speaking so that virtual attendees can hear you. For members attending virtually, please remember to unmute your device before speaking and mute when you are not speaking to create a positive experience for all attendees. Phone participants should use star six to mute and unmute and star nine to raise their hand. Lisa, please proceed with the roll call. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. When I call your name, please respond. Danae Pressler. Present. Thank you. Robert Bondenacher. Present. Thank you. John Sherrill. Present. Thank you. Derek Costaneda. Present. Thank you. Ron Gritman. Here. Thank you. Hondo Judd. Mario Saldamondo. Present. Thank you. Deb Ferraro. Present. Thank you. Jay Davies. Nancy Allen. Present. Thank you. Scott DeBias. Present. Thank you. Ramona Simpson. Tim Connor. Jonathan Fudge. Present. Thank you. Present. Christina Hoppes. Walter Bouchard. Present. Thank you. Amanda McGinnis. Amanda McGinnis. Present. Thank you. Joe Martini. Present. Thank you. Beverly Chanowski. Present. Thank you. Present. Michelle Wilson. Present. Thank you. Michael Denby. Steve Trussell. Present. What is on mute? Thank you. JC Porter. Present. Thank you. Dave Barry. Edward Stillings. Present. Thank you. Spencer Camps. Kim Butler. Present. Thank you. Liz Foster. Stan Ballone. Present. Thank you. Kristen Watt. Present. Thank you. Michelle Kamikawa. Present. Thank you. Michael Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Robert Forrest. Present. Thank you. Susie Stevens. Did I miss anyone? Yeah, this is uh, Jay Davies from Peoria. I think you called my name right as I was getting on. Thank you, Mr. Davies. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Lisa. A quorum is now present. The meeting of the MAG Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee is now called to order. Thank you for attending today's meeting. Copies of today's meeting agenda packet are available on the information table in the hallway. The presentation is posted on the MAG website under today's Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee meeting. The MAG public comment process provides opportunities for members of the public to comment on items scheduled on today's agenda or on items that fall under MAG's jurisdiction. Opportunities are provided for public comment under call to the audience and action items. MAG also provides the opportunity for members of the public to submit written comments via the MAG website prior to the meeting, as long as the comments are received at least one hour 
prior to the posted start time for the meeting. If you would like to comment at today's meeting, please fill out a white request to speak card located on the information table in the hallway. Be sure to, please be sure to indicate the item for which you want to speak and give it to a designated MAG staff member. If you parked in the garage, remember to validate your ticket. Parking validators are available on the information table in the hallway. For those who purchased a transit ticket to come to the meeting, please see staff for a ticket. Please note that hearing assisted devices are available from MAG staff. For agenda item number two, call to the audience. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on items that fall under MAG's jurisdiction that are not on the agenda or that are on the agenda for discussion and not for action. 15 minutes will be provided for the call to the audience agenda item unless the committee requests an exception to this limit. Members of the public who are attending in person may deliver their comments from the lectern at the front of the room. You have up to three minutes to complete your comments. A timer is provided to assist you. When the light on the timer changes from green to yellow, you have one minute remaining. If the light turns red, a buzzer will sound, meaning your allotted time has expired. Have we received any requests to speak cards for, for an agenda item? Madam Chair, we did not receive any written cards. Are there any other members of the public here today who desire to speak on an item? Okay. MAG also provides the opportunity for members of the public to submit written comments prior to the meeting, as long as the comments are received at least one hour prior to the posted start time. Do we have any written comments? Madam Chair, we do not have any written comments. Okay, thank you. For agenda item number three, approval of the March 24th, 2022 meeting minutes. Is there any discussion on the meeting minutes? Okay, hearing none. Uh, prior to taking a vote on agenda item number three, do we have any speaker cards for this item or any written comments? Madam Chair, we do not have any written comments. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the March 24th, 2022 meeting minutes? This is John Sherrill, so moved. Thank this you, John. This is Ramona Simpson. I will second. Thank you, Ramona. We have a motion from John Sherrill and a second from Ramona Simpson. Can I have a voice vote of those in the room? Those in favor, say aye. 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 We're just doing those in the room right now, and I will be um, on to those uh, virtually in just a second. So. Um, again, a voice vote for those in the room. Um, any opposed say nay. And again, for those in the room, those who wish to abstain from the, from the vote, please say abstain. Abstain. Thank you. Okay, we will now be doing a roll call vote of all members participating virtually, and this will be taken by Lisa Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, when I called your name, please state your vote. Danae Pressler. Aye. Thank you. Robert Bondenacher. Aye. Aye. John Sherrill. Aye. Thank you. Derek Castaneda. Aye. Thank you. Ron Gritman. Aye. Thank you. Hondo Judd. Megan Sheldon. Aye. Sorry. Mario Saldamando. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Deb Ferraro. Aye. Thank you. Jay Davies. Abstain. Thank you. Scott DeBias. Aye. Thank you. Ramona Simpson. Aye. Thank you. Tim Connor. Jonathan Fudge. Abstain. Thank you. 
Christina Hopes. Walter Bouchard. Aye. Thank you. Amanda McGinnis. Abstain. Thank you. Joe Martini. Aye. Thank you. Beverly Chanelski. Aye. Thank you. Michelle Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Steve Trussell. Uh, aye. Thank you. JC Porter. Aye. Thank you. Kim Butler. Aye. Thank you. Liz Foster. Michelle Kamikawa. Abstain. Thank you. Michael Chamberlain. Abstain. Thank you. Robert Forrest. Aye. Thank you. Susie Stevens. One moment, please. Madam Chair, we have 22 ayes and five abstentions. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, for agenda item number four, the draft 2022 serious area particulate plan for PM10 for the West Pinnell County non-attainment area presentation by Matt Poppin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Today we're presenting the draft 2022 serious area particulate plan for PM10 for the West Pinal County non-attainment area. We will be uh, providing an overview presentation on the plan, and then there will be an opportunity for the committee to take action to recommend the plan for adoption to the MAG Management Committee. Um, we just wanna say we appreciate the committee's work and review on the plan. Um, related to producing this draft plan. We really appreciate it. Uh, next slide, please. So initially on May 31st, 2012 is when EPA initially designated the West Pinal PM10 non-attainment area as a moderate area. And the attainment date was December 31st, 2018. Then on June 24th, 2020, EPA published a final rule to determine that the non-attainment area has failed to meet the PM10 standard by that attainment date. Um, and reclassified the area to a serious area. The serious area attainment date is now December 31st, 2022, and a plan is due to EPA by uh, January 24th, 2022. Next slide. So I wanna go over an overview of just some of the key uh, serious area plan requirements that are included in this, in this draft plan. Uh, the plan is required to demonstrate attainment of the PM10 standard at all the monitors by the attainment date. Uh, the plan is required to include best available control measures to achieve the maximum degree of emissions reductions from significant PM10 sources. And the plan is also required to include contingency measures that will be implemented if the area fails to attain the standard or make reasonable further progress. Next slide, please. Um, the Clean Air Act does allow for an extension of the serious area attainment date if a couple requirements are met and that extension can be up to five years. Uh, the requirements are that you have to demonstrate that attainment by December 31st, 2022 is impractical. You have to show compliance with all requirements and commitments in the plan, and the plan must include the most stringent measures that are included in any plan of any state or achieved in practice in any state, and that can be feasibly implemented in the area. So to date, because of the multiple exceedances of the PM10 standard at the Hidden Valley Monitor, um, it is impractical to attain the standard by December 31st, 2022. So the 2022 draft plan does include a request for an extension of the attainment date 
until December 31st, 2026. This is a four year extension request. Next slide, please. Here's an overview of where the non-attainment area is located. It's in the Western portion of Pinal County and the red dots uh, show the location of PM10 monitors within the non-attainment area. Next slide, please. This slide shows the number of exceedances by monitor um, for the last, for the years 2016 through 2020. Uh, the gray bars uh, represent what we are calling standard exceedances and the yellow uh, cross-hatched bars are high wind dust event exceedances. Um, and then the total was represented at the top of the bars. Um, so you can see that the monitor with the most exceedances is the Hidden Valley monitor. Next slide, please. Uh, the base year for the draft plan is 2017, and this is a pie chart of the PM10 emissions for that base year that's within the non-attainment area. The, the total uh, emissions within the non-attainment area is 41,168 tons per year. Um, and you can see that the largest uh, category of emissions within the entire non-attainment area is, is uh, dust from unpaved roads largely. Next slide, please. So the plan also contains best available control measures and most stringent measures. And these measures were identified through an extensive review of available measures and 70 candidate measures were identified for inclusion in a suggested list of measures that were provided to the Air Quality Committee and ultimately approved by the MAG Regional Council for consideration by implementation by implementing entities. Uh, resolutions committing to implement 61 of the 70 suggested measures were received from the Governor's Agricultural Best Management Practices Committee and the Pinal County Board of Supervisors. And those commitments have been included in the draft plan. Uh, the committed measures meet BACM and MSM requirements and are sufficient to demonstrate attainment of the PM10 standard by the December 31st, 2026 um, uh, date. And that's the most expeditious date possible that the standard can be met. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a pie chart of the controlled attainment year inventory of 2026. So you can see the reduction in emissions are pretty substantial from 40, approximately 41,000 in 2017 to 34,000 tons per year in 2026. The mix of sources remains uh, largely the same, but there is uh, reductions in almost uh, a large majority of the categories, including uh, windblown dust as well as um, activity-based categories. Uh, next slide, please. The plan was also able to demonstrate attainment at the monitors. Um, on eight specific design days. Um, so the table below shows the eight design days that were uh, chosen uh, to demonstrate attainment for. These include a mix of low wind, stagnant condition days, as well as high wind, elevated wind days uh, under various conditions, whether that be a passing of a cold front or a, a thunderstorm or monsoon activity. And so as long as the uh, attainment year concentrations are below 150, we are showing that the controls are sufficient to demonstrate attainment at the monitors. And all of the monitors uh, show values below 150 based on the controls included in the plan. Uh, next slide, please. The plan also includes reasonable further progress and milestones for reasonable further progress, which is required by the Clean Air Act for all non-attainment area plans. Reasonable further progress is met by demonstrating incremental reductions in PM10 emissions from the 2017 base year until the 2026 attainment year. Clean Air Act requires that milestones be established every three years until the area is redesignated attainment, uh, which helped to demonstrate that reasonable further progress is being made. So the milestone years uh, for this plan are 2017, 2020, 2023, and 2026. Uh, next slide, please. This is the graph of PM10 emissions demonstrating that reasonable further progress is demonstrated, is met with the controls that are in the plan. You can see an incremental reduction in PM10 emissions every year from the base year until the attainment year of 2026. And you can also see that the controls in the plan continue to provide PM10 emission reductions beyond the attainment year with reduced emissions in the year 2027 as well. 
and those committed controls will provide continuing benefits uh, in years past 2027 as well, although not shown on this graph. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another element that's required in the plan are contingency measures. Um, contingency measures are to be implemented if the area fails to make reasonable further progress or to attain the standard by the attainment date. EPA has recommended that contingency measures provide the emission reductions equivalent to one year's average increment of RFP. For our plan, that's 794.62 tons per year. So the 2022 serious area plan does include a contingency measure to reduce the speed limit on public unpaved roads from 25 miles per hour to 15 miles per hour. Um, the PM10 emission reductions from implementation of this measure in 2027, the first year after attainment theoretically would be failed uh, to be met, equal 950 tons, which exceeds the one year average uh, uh, RFP increment. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, um, the plan also includes motor vehicle emission budgets for transportation conformity. Uh, motor vehicle emission budgets include uh, PM10 emissions from exhaust, tire and brake wear from on-road vehicles, road construction emissions, re-entrained paved road dust, and unpaved road dust. And the motor vehicle emission budgets, budgets are established for the 2023 reasonable further progress milestone year as well as the 2026 attainment year. Uh, the budgets here are listed in, in kilograms per day for those two years. Next slide, please. Um, the public comment period, we uh, began on March 21st and was uh, the 30 day review period ended on April 20th, 2022. Uh, no public comments were received during that period and there was no request uh, to hold a public hearing during that period. However, one comment was received from the Arizona Center for Law and the Public Interest after the close of the public comment period, and that was received on April 22nd, 2022. Next slide. So we're gonna go ahead and include a response to that comment for the committee's benefit. Um, because it's an official comment, we felt it best to include the comment word for word in our response word for word. So if the committee will indulge me, I'm just gonna read the comment and the response. So this comment is from Jennifer Anderson of the Arizona Center for Law and the Public Interest. It states, I don't agree that a 25 mile per hour speed limit on unpaved roads, whether public or private, is backum slash MSM. I have seen or driven on numerous unpaved roads in Arizona, including private ones, with speed limits below that. For example, I happen to be in Patagonia today, and there is a private unpaved road called Red Rock Drive that serves the Red Rock acres development and has a speed limit of 15 miles per hour. See pictures below. In Flagstaff, there is a private unpaved road called North Rain Tree Road that has a speed limit of 20 miles per hour, as I recall. These are more stringent measures achieved in practice right here in Arizona and certainly feasible to implement in West Pinal. See Clean Air Act 188, uh, parentheses two. This will necessitate another contingency measure or group of contingency measures for the plan. But since lowering speed limits to 15 mile per hour is MSM, it is necessary to include this as a control measure in order to obtain the five-year extension of the attainment date. And the, and the commenter also provided two photographs, as you can see below, one of a speed limit sign and one of a, a, a crossroads and a stop sign. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the response to the comment received. Uh, chapters four, five, and nine of the 2022 Serious Area Particulate Plan for PM10 for the West Pinal County non-attainment area provide detailed discussions on how the requirements for best available control measures back them and most stringent measures were met. As explained in chapters four and five, EPA's back them guidance established in its 1994 addendum to the general preamble for implementing Title I of the Clean Air Act was followed and resulted in an extensive review of PM10 control measures and provisions adopted in other serious PM10 non-attainment areas or formerly serious PM10 areas to identify back and for significant PM10 sources in the West Pinal County non-attainment area. As explained in chapter nine of the identified back -um, the strictest of those measures were selected for implementation in order to meet MSM requirements. For unpaved roads, two existing rules from serious PM10 areas 
were identified that have relevant speed limit provisions. The San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District Rule 8061 and the South Coast Air Quality Management District Rule 1186. As explained in Appendix C, exhibit, or Appendix C, Exhibit 2, and the BACM slash MSM comparison tables for unpaved road controls, provisions in both of these rules were found to be more stringent than existing unpaved road controls in the West Pinal County PM10 non-attainment area. As explained there, the relative stringency of provisions in Rule 8061 and Rule 1186 was initially unclear because of the differences in provisions related to the types of unpaved roads subject to the rules, applicable annual daily average trip thresholds, and where speed limits were required. Ultimately, as explained below, it was determined that the provisions in the San Joaquin Valley Rule 8061 were the most stringent and were therefore identified as backum slash MSN for unpaved roads. Next slide. And this is the last uh, comment slide. Response slide. Rule 8061 has an AAD threshold of 26. All public and private road segments with less than 26 AADT are exempt and includes a 25 mile per hour speed limit on roads at or above 26 as specified in sections four and 5.25 respectively. Speed limit related requirements for unpaved roads in rule 1186 section D subsection five only apply to public unpaved roads above an AADT threshold that is based on the average AADT of all unpaved public roads. The South Coast rule does contain a speed limit of 15 as a control option, but it is not a requirement. The 15 mile per hour speed limit is but one element from a menu of three controls of which only one must be implemented. The other two elements are paving and or chemical stabilization. Applying the South Coast Rule 1186 average AAD provision to the 2017 base year unpaved public roads in West Pinal County yields an effective threshold of 74 AADT, which is less stringent than the 26 AAD threshold in the San Joaquin Valley Rule 8061. In addition, the 25 mile per hour speed limit on unpaved roads of 26 AADT or more in Rule 8061 is mandatory. Therefore, as applied to public roads in West Pinal County, Rule 8061 provisions, including the mandatory 25 mile per hour speed limit, were determined to be the most stringent and were thus identified as BACM slash MSM in the West Pinal County non-attainment area. As discussed in Chapter 8, the Pinal County Air Quality Control District developed a contingency measure that, if triggered due to failure to make reasonable further progress or attainment, would require a mandatory 15 mile per hour speed limit on public unpaved road, roads. A mandatory 15 mile per hour speed limit on public unpaved roads is a new and novel PM10 control measure that exceeds the requirements provisions of existing public unpaved road control measures as analyzed and identified in the BACM and MSM analyses described above. For this reason, the 15 mile per hour speed limit contingency measure is not required to be a most stringent measure. Finally, the 15 or 20 mile per hour unpaved road speed limits identified by the commenter as existing in other parts of Arizona, such as Patagonia or Flagstaff, do not constitute BACM or MSM. These unpaved roads appear to be examples of private unpaved roads in areas that are not PM10 non-attainment areas. There are no air quality regulations in the areas in these areas that mandate speed limits of 15 miles per hour or 20 miles per hour for the express control of PM10 emissions. These speed limits could have been established for a variety of reasons, including road safety and noise slash nuisance issues. As such, examples of unpaved roads with posted speed limits that appear to be unrelated to the control of PM10 emissions should not be included in analyses to identify BACM or MSM. So uh, next slide, please. So here's the remaining schedule for the plan. March 21st, 2022, the draft plan was made available for public review. And then today on April 26, 2022, the MAG Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee may recommend adoption of the plan. Additionally, on May 10th, 2022, the Sun Corridor Metropolitan Planning Organization may adopt the plan. Um, this is because both the Sun Corridor MPO and the MAG uh, region are located within uh, the non-attainment area. 
On May 11, 2022, the MAG Management Committee may recommend the plan for adoption to the Regional Council. And then on May 25, 2022, the MAG Regional Council may adopt the plan. And then the plan would be submitted to ADEQ and EPA by May 31, 2022. Next slide. So I'm available, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any uh, questions the committee may have, and then we can move on to the action. Thank you, Mr. Poppin. Do I have any questions here in the room? Is there any discussion or questions from those online? Okay, hearing none. Prior to taking a vote on agenda item four, staff, do we have any speaker cards for this item or any written comments? Madam Chair, we did not receive any speaker cards nor any written comments. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to recommend to adopt the draft 2022 Serious Area Particulate Plan for PM10 for the West Pinal County non-attainment area? This is Scott Tobias with Pinal County, so moved. Is there a second? This is Ramona Simpson, Town of Queen Creek. I will second. Thank you, Ramona. Okay, we will do the vote in two parts as we did earlier. So can I have, um, oh, so we have a motion from Scott Tobias and a second from Ramona Simpson. Can I have a voice vote of those in the room? Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Those who wish to abstain from the vote, say abstain. Thank you to those in the room. A roll call vote of all members participating virtually will now be taken by Lisa Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, when I call your name, please state your vote. Danae Pressler. Aye. Thank you. Robert Bondenacher. Aye. Thank you. John Sherrill. Aye. Thank you. Derek Costaneda. Aye. Thank you. Ron Gritman. Aye. Thank you. Mario Saldamondo. Aye. Thank you. Deb Ferraro. Deb Ferraro. Jay Davies. Aye. Thank you. Scott DeBias. Aye. Thank you. Ramona Simpson. Aye. Thank you. Jonathan Fudge. Aye. Thank you. Walter Bouchard. Amanda McGinnis. Abstain. Thank you. Joe Martini. Aye. Thank you. Beverly Chanowski. Aye. Thank you. Michelle Wilson. Abstain. Thank you. Steve Trussell. Abstain. Thank you. JC Porter. Aye. Thank you. Hello. Kim Butler. Aye. Thank you. Michelle Kamikawa. Abstain. Thank you. Michael Chamberlain. Abstain. Thank you. Robert Forrest. Aye. Thank you. 
Did I miss anyone? Uh, this is Walt Bouchard. I think I was muted. I uh, intended to say I. Would you please indicate that in my vote? Thank you. One moment, please. And this is Deb Ferraro. I was unable to unmute myself for some reason, but I would like records to show that I voted aye. Thank in you. Favor. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 21 ayes and five abstentions. Thank you, Lisa. The motion passes. Moving on to agenda item number five, EPA notice proposing to reclassify the Maricopa eight hour ozone non-attainment area from marginal to moderate for the 2015 ozone standard. Matt Poppin will provide the presentation. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. We wanna share with you uh, EPA's recent action proposing to reclassify the Maricopa eight hour ozone non-attainment area to a moderate area from the current status of, of marginal. Uh, next slide, please. As a reminder, here is the boundary of the non-attainment area for the 2015 ozone standard. Uh, covers a large portion of Maricop Maricopa County, um, a very small portion of Gila County, and then um, also a, as, um, a larger portion of Pinal County. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the base year for the um, for reasonable further progress purposes and, and when we initially submitted the marginal area plan for this area was 2017. So we wanted to show the committee what the ozone season day emissions are um, for, uh, for this area. And again, ozone is, a is made up from a combination of VOC and NOx emissions. So this is a pie chart of the ozone season day of VOC emissions, um, a large contribution from biogenic sources, um, the next largest category would be area or non-point sources. And then we have contributions from on-road sources, non-road sources, and a small contribution from point sources. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of NOx, here's the pie chart for that. The largest category are on-road sources, followed by non-road sources, and then area or non-point sources, point sources in the smallest category is biogenics. Next slide, please. So in EPA's proposed reclassification, um, they didn't just do it for our area, they are proposing action on 31 marginal areas throughout the country. And again, the 2015 standard is the strictest standard of 0 0.070 parts per million. Uh, this is based on the fact that the Maricopa eight hour ozone non-attainment area did not meet the standard by the August 3rd, 2021 attainment date and also did not qualify for a one-year extension of the attainment date. In order to meet the August 3rd, 2021 attainment date, the area needed to have clean data in the years 2018 through 2020. So because of this, EPA is proposing to reclassify the region from a marginal area to a moderate area. If finalized, a, mod a moderate area state implementation plan is due to EPA by January 1st, 2023, which is an extremely tight deadline. Um, comments on the proposed rule are due to EPA by June 13th, 2022. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to kind of give the committee an update on where we are with ozone monitoring data to help understand. Um, what you can see here is the uh, trend data starting back from 2000 all the way through the most recent period we have available, three-year period we have available, which is 2019 through 2021. Um, the blue line represents um, ozone concentrations when uh, you do not exclude wildfire impacted days. The red line represents what we believe to be ozone concentrations when those wildfire exceptional events are removed. Um, and that's based on days that have been identified and flagged by the Maricopa County Air Quality Department as being affected by uh, wildfires. Um, some additional work will be needed between Maricopa County, ADEQ, and MAG on firming up those dates. Um, but you can see there has been a significant impact from wildfires um, from when it used to be uh, wildfires did not impact our region that much. But beginning in 2017, year after year, the impact has been uh, extensive. 
So there's the difference in our current design value is 80 with wildfires included and 73 with them excluded. So it makes a huge difference and impacts greatly our ability to show attainment of the standard in future years. Uh, next slide, please. So again, here are the tiers of ozone non-attainment area classifications and the controls associated with them. Currently, we're still a marginal area, um, which is the lowest on the pyramid. Um, we have already submitted a marginal area pan, which EPA has uh, approved and finalized in terms of the base year inventory and the emission statements rule. Um, so when you bump up to moderate, a couple things happen. Uh, one, the uh, what we call a new source review offset ratio goes up from 1.1 to 1.15. This is the amount of emissions a major source, which is 100 tons or more, a major point source has to replace if they're new or if they modify uh, their operations. So for every one pound or one ton of emissions, they have to come up with offsets of 1.15 tons or 1.15 pounds, uh, as an example. Um, a couple other things, a couple other major requirements that kick in. We have to do an attainment demonstration to show that we'll meet the standard by the attainment date, which would be August 3rd, 2024. Um, uh, racked reasonable available control technology for VOC and NOx major sources has to be done. Um, that's an evaluation of the rules that are currently in place, largely, for major sources, major point sources, industrial electrical generating units, manufacturing facilities. So the Maricopa County will be busy doing a RACT analysis of our existing rules to see if they meet uh, what's known as CTG, control, technical, uh, control technology guidelines that the EPA publishes. And then there's also, you have to demonstrate a 15% reduction in VOC emissions from your base year to your attainment year over a six year period. We already have vehicle inspection and maintenance programs in place. We've had those for a long time. So that's not a new requirement. And then we'll have to come up with the contingency measure, which will be difficult. Uh, next slide. I, I kind of went over the uh, key requirements in that pyramid, but I've listed them here again. Again, the attainment date is now, if finalized, would be August 3rd, 2024. Since that attainment date is in the middle of the summer of 2024, uh, in order to show attainment with that attainment date, you have to have clean monitoring data from 2021 through 2023. So we're already one year into that period. So the 2021 data would be part of uh, showing attainment. Uh, re the plan is required to demonstrate uh, reasonable further progress by showing at least a 15% reduction in VOC emissions over a six year period. Um, there are some other options the implementation rule provides, but this is the general requirement. Um, to show RFP. Um, as I mentioned, RACT now applies. Um, and then additionally, uh, which is separate from RACT, is a reasonably available control measures analysis. This requires the area to adopt all reasonable measures to meet RFP requirements and to demonstrate attainment as expeditiously as practicable. So this is broader than just the point sources that uh, RACT focuses on. This is all sources of emissions. Um, and you have to do a pretty comprehensive evaluation of existing uh, VOC and NOx controls in other areas and in our area to see if they are reasonable. If there are any new controls out there that might help uh, speed attainment, we have to consider those for adoption in the area. Um, one new requirement uh, that hasn't been present before but is present in the implementation rule for the 2015 ozone standard as EPA further requires that you don't just evaluate Rackham for sources within the non-attainment area, you have to look at Rackham for sources throughout the state if any of those statewide sources impact attainment within the non-attainment area. So if there are significant emission sources located outside the non-attainment area and they affect our ability to show, demonstrate attainment, those could be subject to Rackham as well under EPA's new implementation guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. So what are our options moving forward? So there's a couple options. Uh, one is just to develop and submit what we would call a traditional non-attainment area state implementation plan that demonstrates the area will attain the 2015 ozone standard by the attainment date. That will require the evaluation and implementation of RACT 
and will require the evaluation and implementation of Rackham as needed for attainment, including the evaluation and need for new controls as uh, to demonstrate attainment. Uh, this will also require a demonstration of reasonable further progress reductions by showing that 15% reduction in VOC emissions over a six year period. And it will also require the development of new contingency measures that would be triggered if the area fails to, to meet the attainment date or fails to show reasonable further progress. Next slide. Uh, the Clean Air Act also provides uh, a section of the Clean Air Act called Section 179B, which provides an option to prepare a demonstration that the area will meet or would have met the attainment date, but for international emissions. Um, and there are two paths forward for that type of demonstration. One is called a prospective demonstration, which is kind of a future demonstration, and one is a retrospective. So an example of a prospective demonstration would be the Maricopa non-attainment area will meet the moderate area attainment date, but for international emissions. A retrospective would have been the Maricopa non-attainment area would have met the marginal area attainment date, but for international emissions. So you can go forward and backward. Similarly, if we get to uh, the August 3rd, 2024 attainment and we're not showing attainment, we could do a retrospective 179B at that point to say, hey, we would have made it. You should leave us at moderate, but for uh, emissions from Asia and or Mexico that are uh, getting us over the standard. Um, if EPA does approve a 179B demonstration, then the area is locked in at that uh, uh, classification and can't ever be bumped up higher again. So if they were to approve us for a moderate area, we'd be locked in at moderate. Even if you fail to uh, not meet your attainment deadline, they can't bump you up to serious or further along. Um, but I will, uh, that's, I would say that all of the other requirements still remain in place. So you still have to do racked and you still have to do a rack and demonstration for a moderate area and higher. Um, so those are some of the options available for a 179B. The bar is pretty hard, it's pretty high on 179B demonstrations. As part of their EPA's proposal, they included two examples of 179B demonstrations that they have rejected. Um, so um, there is, uh, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to prove this to EPA, especially if you're not right next to the border, which is what they historically have approved these for. They've approved them for Imperial Valley, um, Nogales. So it would be a departure for them to approve it in an area that's further away from the border, like we are. Uh, next slide, please. Again, the other thing that's of critical importance is we have to address wildfire affected ozone sequences. So whether we would choose to pursue a traditional non-attainment area SIP or a 179B, those wildfire uh, days are still have to be addressed in order to show attainment or model attainment under either scenario because they are so high. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we had some of the highest concentrations we've seen in 20 years in this region. And those were highly correlated, highly affected by wildfire smoke. So EPA gives a couple options on how to exclude uh, ozone exceedances affected by wildfires. One, you can go with the traditional exceptional events rule documentation, which we have done before. Uh, EPA has approved uh, an event in 2017 and 2015 for this region. That's a lot of work. That's an extensive amount of documentation. EPA also has additional guidance that allows you to without having to go through the exceptional event process, you can possibly modify, uh, you can maybe exclude days from your modeling or lower the design values. So there are some other options. So we continue to explore those and we'll have more conversations about those moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So that's kind of the update on where things stand. I'm available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any questions here in the room? Do we have any questions from those attending online? Hi, this is Danae with Avondale. Madam Chair, Commissioners, Mr. Poppin, I have um, 
just trying to get a better grip on what this would mean for cities and the businesses within them. Um, can you give us uh, just a little bit more information on, on some tangible impacts to industries in our cities? Sure. So one important thing to remember is that we are already still a moderate non-attainment area for the prior 2008 ozone standard. So most of the cities within the MAG region are already under moderate area requirements. Um, Maricopa County uh, back in 2015, 2016 did a racked analysis for the rules at that point for the 2008 ozone standard. And we did a RACM analysis at that time. So by for the two, now that we're at the stricter 2015 ozone standard, bumping up to moderate is kind of a status quo move in some ways. So for example, those offset ratios are already in place for business and industry. Um, we just have to go through the analysis again. So the likely outcomes are that uh, Maricopa County and the portion of Pinal County that's covered by the area will have to do this raft analysis. So they'll have to evaluate the rules that are in place. If they find that there are other rules that are stricter or the CTGs are stricter, that could result in the adoption of stricter uh, controls than what's currently in place. And then again, the RACM analysis, um, if it helps to speed attainment, if it can help to ex expedite attainment, new measures could come into place under a RACM analysis. Um, that could affect uh, uh, sources of NOx and VOC within the region. Those are probably the two most likely outcomes. Again, um, our ability to demonstrate attainment will be highly affected by how many wildfire exceedance days we can remove. If we're forced to start with 80 as our baseline, it's pretty highly unlikely to show attainment by 2023 with that high baseline. It's just un, uh, you would need fourth high values in the mid 60s um, for this year and next year in order to reach that. So those, those values have to be addressed. So a lot of it is up in the air, but those are probably some of the main impacts that are likely to be occurring. It's this new evaluation of RACT, which is very specific to major sources and source categories, then the broader RACM analysis. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for those online? Madam Chair, Commission members, Mr. Pop, and this is Danae with Avondale again. This one is more of a comment, um, but when we are looking at uh, future measures, I think it'll be really important that we're taking electric vehicles into consideration as ways to reduce some of our major sources of emissions. Um, so please uh, be sure to include that in the evaluation. And then the other thing is the way that we're talking about wildfires, uh, we know that projections are wildfires will continue to increase in intensity and frequency um, in our area and, and across uh, much of the Southwest. And the way that, I, that I'm hearing us talk about it is kind of looking at how do we take take those wildfires out of this uh, evaluation. But the reality is that it is reducing air quality. And so I think we also need to look at how can we help prevent and mitigate wildfires uh, and, and what does good forest management look like and et cetera. So uh, while I understand we're trying to meet attainment, we do also have to be realistic that this, the air quality needs to improve on the whole in order to benefit our communities. Thank you for your comment. I, I would add that we have had discussions with EPA about electric vehicles. So they are aware, I think everybody is aware that the number of electric vehicles is going to significantly increase. I think that's pretty clear now. Um, and so we continue to have discussions with EPA about how to implement, um, how to take credit for, how to show, how to model those in the future. So that is something we continue uh, to have discussions with EPA about. Terrific, thank you for that. Thank you for those questions. Do we have anyone else online that would like to ask a question? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number six. 
EPA final rule to approve the base year emissions inventory in the MAG 2020 eight hour ozone plan, some middle of marginal area requirements. And Matt's going to do, a, <laughs> is going to present that as well. Yes, thank you. Just really briefly, we just wanted to provide this with the committee. Um, we were just uh, uh, excited to see that EPA has finally approved the base year inventory for uh, for the 2015 ozone standards. So we just wanted to provide that to, to the committee. That's a good thing. We'll be using that in any type of uh, path forward for the um, upcoming moderate area plan and or address. So that's a good part to that. If there's any questions on that. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room? And any questions online? Okay, thank you. So agenda item number seven is the heat impact uh, economic study by Anna Bettis of the, the Nature Conservancy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today virtually. Um, I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Anna Bettis. I am the Healthy Cities Program Director for the Nature Conservancy in Arizona. I joined about two and a half years ago, and my background is primarily in sustainability. I've been working in the Valley in that space for about a decade, including in academia, some philanthropy, and also at a municipal level. And I have my master's in sustainability solutions. So just delighted to share these findings with you today. Um, and also before I get into the study itself, I just wanna say a few words about the Nature Conservancy for those of you who may not be familiar with our work in cities. A lot of people may know TNC as a conservation organization and historically much of our work has focused on protecting pristine areas. Um, we are the largest conservation organization in the world operating in all 50 states and in 72 countries. Our um, Healthy Cities program, which is where the economic assessment falls in our work, started about six years ago. So this is a relatively new but important area for us. We recognized that the world is rapidly urbanizing. We know that already more than 80% of the population in the US lives in cities and a lot of our most critical problems are in cities. And so we're trying to address some of those challenges by actually bringing nature into cities. Um, and our work looks different depending on the local context, but certainly in Phoenix, a big focus has been extreme heat. You can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so let's talk for just a moment about that issue of heat. Um, as you may know, heat is the leading weather-related cause of death in the U.S., and the highest rates nationally are found in Arizona. The Phoenix metro area is the hottest large metro area in the U.S., and so we're really looking at how we and with partners can help lead the way on addressing that challenge for the region. Um, it's already having major consequences. You know, for example, in 2021, I believe the latest numbers with the Maricopa County Department of Public Health were um, 339 heat associated deaths. I know there's still a couple under investigation, but that's another record breaking year when it comes to heat deaths. Um, and heat is different than other natural disasters because you don't necessarily see it when you look out the window that you might with maybe a tornado or a hurricane. And yet it is this slow moving and persistent threat that we're facing. You can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so while heat affects everyone, it doesn't affect everyone in quite the same way. As you can see in these maps of the Phoenix metro area, the hottest areas also have the lowest tree canopy cover and the highest child poverty. I know they're quite small, uh, except maybe those of you in the room, maybe they're not very small, um, but I wanted to show them side by side so that you could see kind of the trends. I'm pointing like you can see my, my mouse here, but um, on the, the left side, the map, uh, the darker red areas have a higher land surface temperature. And that's a metric that we often look at because it correlates more closely with how you actually feel as opposed to air temperature. And then the middle map, the lighter green areas um, are the places with the lower tree canopy cover. If you look at kind of that red one, um, you can see kind of an L down Glendale, kind of near South Phoenix. And if you track that to the middle map, you can see there's more of that light green. And then on the, the right side, that's child poverty and the darker blue represents the places with the higher percentage of child poverty. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so when we talk about heat and disparities, you know, the good news is that we know there are things that we can do to reduce heat. 
Um, one more point on the disparity issue I forgot to mention on the last slide. Um, there's research also that shows that there's neighborhoods as little as two miles apart that can have as much as a 13 degree difference. And that study actually was air temperature. So you can imagine you know, what that would mean for families in, in those different communities. Um, this project, the Economic Assessment of Heat in the Phoenix Metro Area, can go to the next slide. Um, we started about a year ago to better understand the extent of the impact in monetary terms of urban heat, as well as the costs and benefits of some solutions and to make the economic case to incorporate and invest in the use of solutions for addressing this issue. And so our goal with the assessment is really, we'd like to mobilize people from the government, private sector and communities and make them aware that number one, there is this problem. Number two, there are things that can be done. And number three, if we do not do something, there will be consequences. Go to the next slide. Just a few details about how we approach the project. So we contracted with a consulting firm called ACOM to carry out the assessment. And then we also convened an advisory committee comprised of key stakeholders and leaders in the community. Um, and those individuals played a critical role in steering this effort and also identified existing data and data sources and reviewed the findings. You can see the organizations represented there go to the next slide. I'll just say this would not have been possible without their guidance, their time, and their commitment to the project. So we're really fortunate to have had that. Go to the next slide, please. And um, one more, actually. Thank you. Before I get into the numbers, I'll provide some background information to describe how we conducted the study. So we followed three steps. The first was to conduct a conditions analysis to understand how temperature would change in the Phoenix metro area in the future. Uh, we looked at the costs, what the cost would be to the Phoenix metro area if no action is taken to address these warming temperatures, looking at two future time horizons, 2030 and 2050. And then lastly, what can we do about this? So what solutions are out there and what are their cost effectiveness? And the full technical report is available on our webpage. I'm happy to put that in the chat if if you're interested, um, or you can get all the supporting details and methodologies, but today I'll just share uh, um, the high level findings. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So before I dig into the findings, I also wanna uh, just get an understanding of the underlying key concepts that the study is based on. So most of the economic methodologies that we applied use a baseline climate or typical climate conditions as a reference point to understand how impacts will change with more heat. And these baseline conditions are dependent on the period between 1986 and 2005. And then we looked at two future time horizons. Also note that these numbers provide a snapshot of the cost in an average, not in a typical or extreme year. And also that we're presenting two emission scenarios, one in which emissions are reduced and another higher emission scenario. And lastly, our report does not project economic conditions or change in population. Uh, we're basing it off of current conditions. But that being said, we do have a section where we look at how demographics will change in the region, which I'll touch on briefly right now. You can go to the next slide, please. And one more. Thank you. So Maricopa County has grown dramatically in the last few decades. I'm sure I don't have to tell you all that. Um, but going forward, it's projected to continue. The county is expected to grow to 6.2 million by 2050 which is a growth rate of more than double that of the average US population growth over that same period. Um, in addition, if you look to the right here, you can see that the population is expected to age. So between 2020 and 2050, the share of Maricopa County population over 65 is expected to increase from 15 to 23% in 2050. And that means that the ratio of Maricopa County working age population to non-working population is gonna decrease, which will require municipalities to fund increasing infrastructure climate adaptation and social service costs from a smaller relative base of market income. And so this is really the backdrop for a warming climate. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So looking into the future, we found that the average annual days over 110 degrees are anticipated to be between three to five times what they are now in 2030 and 2050. And overall, the annual mean temperatures are also expected to increase with an average of two and a half degrees and four and a half degrees Fahrenheit relative to baseline conditions. Go to the next slide. So what does this mean in terms of cost to society if we don't take action to mitigate this warming? Go to the next slide. 
So the decision of what to cost out for the study was based on a process that was guided by the input of the advisory committee that I mentioned earlier, and was based on relevance to the region and also data availability and feasibility for evaluation. Um, the four areas that we looked at for costing um, were health, labor productivity, roadway infrastructure, and electricity demand. Go to the next slide, please. For health, we looked at mortality and morbidity. The former evaluates heat-related deaths that are either directly heat-related or deaths triggered by extreme heat, while morbidity captures non-life-threatening health impacts that require medical attention. And these impacts are either directly heat-related or triggered by extreme heat as well. And we look specifically at emergency department visits and inpatient hospitalizations. Um, and in addition to health impacts and loss of life, heat-related mortality and morbidity create a number of costs to society. This include the direct cost to patients and the cost of providing care. These also include indirect losses in the form of productivity losses. We'll go to the next slide. So in a baseline year, we estimated heat-related mortality impacts at $1.3 billion. Under future conditions in an average year around 2030, that could increase by $846 million. And around 2050, that can increase by $1.5 billion. We'll go to the next slide, please. Thank you. For morbidity impacts for emergency department visits, we costed the cost to patients. In a baseline year, cost to patients are estimated at $2 million. In the future, that annual cost could rise by $700,000 in 2030 and $1.2 million in 2050. Go to the next slide. And then the last impact we costed was inpatient hospitalizations, where we looked at the cost to patients in an average baseline year. These are estimated at $5.3 million. In the future, that annual cost in an average year could rise by $2.6 million in 2030 and uh, $4.7 million in 2050. Go to the next slide. For labor productivity, extreme heat can pose additional direct costs to businesses in the form of declining labor productivity. We specifically looked at how exposure to high heat can result in loss to gross regional product. GRP is a similar measure to GDP, gross domestic product. It's a metric that measures the size of a region's economy. For reference, the GRP for Maricopa County is just over $260 billion. And go to the next slide. Um, and there are certain jobs that are more at risk, risk to losses in labor productivity. And so we were able to look specifically at these high risk jobs. In Maricopa County, about 20% of jobs are classified as high risk in terms of their exposure to heat and the impact that that has on their labor productivity. Go to the next slide. And so the results for labor productivity, we found that in a future year in 2030, the loss to GRP could be around $731 million. And in 2050, the loss to GRP could be around 1.2 billion, which is equivalent to about 0.4% of Maricopa County's GRP. Go to the next slide, please. Our next economic indicator is the cost of roadway infrastructure. Roadways are especially vulnerable to the impacts of extreme heat, and these vulnerabilities are exacerbated by traffic volumes, which are likely going to increase as the local population grows. Longer periods of extreme heat are expected to compromise pavement integrity by softening the asphalt and increasing pavement deformation or rutting from traffic use. And gradually, these impacts can become more significant over roadways 20 to 30 year life cycle, leading to more maintenance needs. We'll go to the next slide. By 2030, roadway maintenance costs could increase in Maricopa County by $640,000 per year and more substantially by $7.6 million per year by 2050. And an important note, our analysis estimated the impact of increasing temperatures on the total roadway life cycle costs, which is the cost to maintain the roadway, roadways during their 20 to 30 years of expected useful life. And the numbers represented here are an average within that life cycle, average year within that life cycle, excuse me. And go to the next slide. Our last economic indicator is electricity demand. Between now and 2050, climate-driven increases in ambient temperature are expected to increase demand for electricity use. Go to the next slide. Maricopa County can expect summer energy costs to increase by $64 for residential customers and $206 for commercial customers once the average summer temperatures increase by one degree. And an important note, the $64 and $206 increase is over the entire summer period, which we are counting for this study as May through October. 
Um, and this study estimates that the average summer temperatures will increase by one to three degrees by 2030 and up to three to eight degrees by 2050, which suggests that there is potential for average summer electricity bills to increase even more than we've stated here if local electricity providers do not adapt and expand their capacity and pricing to adapt to changing conditions. Let's go to the next slide. So now stepping back when we look at these cost categories collectively, we estimate that projected temperature increases could cost the Phoenix metro area up to $1.9 billion in a low emission scenario in a typical year by 2050. And if emissions are not, not curbed in the coming decades, then this number could climb to up to $2.3 billion by 2050. Go to the next slide. So $2.3 billion in annual costs is not a small sum of money for any area. So what actions can we take now to mitigate the impacts of heat? Go to the next slide. There is certainly a lot that can be done to manage and mitigate heat, many of which are listed here on this slide, but our study focused on just two. Next slide. For the purpose of this study, the project team and advisory committee decided to focus our analysis on the economic benefits to cool roofs and urban tree canopy. Specifically, we analyzed the cost and benefits of deploying cool roofs on 100% of Phoenix metro area buildings. Note, this is only when they would need to be replaced anyway. Um, and then also increasing the urban tree canopy cover to 25%. As I mentioned earlier, we selected these two solutions for a few reasons. Um, number one, across the board, researchers agree that these solutions do provide heat mitigation benefits. Number two, these benefits intersect with the costed um, metrics that we discussed in the first part of the presentation. And then number three, there was existing research and data on these solutions based on the Phoenix metro area. So we had that high quality local data to work with. You can go to the next slide, getting close to the end here. Uh, so in order to quantify the benefits of cool roofs and urban tree canopy, we had to understand how the specific benefits intersected with the economic indicators that we costed. And the primary benefit of both solutions that we looked at is that they have a cooling impact on temperature. This global cooling effect, as we call it, has a direct relationship with each of the economic indicators. And another benefit, which is similar to the global cooling effect, but we call a site-specific benefit, is that the shade from trees and reflection from cool roofs reduce the demand for electricity by reducing the need for internal air conditioning. Go to the next slide. You know, I do wanna call out there's other benefits to these solutions that we did not talk about in this study. Um, we only looked at those that intersected with those um, indicators. Uh, certainly others worth highlighting and that this number is probably conservative when you think about it like that. I uh, can go to the next slide. So cool roofs have the potential to reduce near surface temperature and reduce energy demand for interior cooling by reflecting sunlight and thus absorbing less heat. Next slide. And if the Phoenix metro area were to deploy coal roofs on 100% of its buildings, we found that there would be $8 billion in avoided damages. Meanwhile, deploying coal roofs on buildings would cost the Phoenix metro area just 1.5 billion. And this means that the coal roof benefits outweigh the cost by 5.2. Go to the next slide. Urban trees and urban tree canopy provide shade and transpire water, which has the effect of reducing urban surface and air temperature and thus improving thermal comfort and reducing energy demand for interior cooling. Next slide. And we estimated that the impact of increasing the Phoenix metro area's tree canopy to 25% would lead to avoided heat-related damages valued at over $15 billion. Meanwhile, re re uh, reaching the 25% tree canopy would cost the Phoenix metro area just $4 billion. And this means that the urban tree canopy benefits outweigh the cost by 3.8. Go to the next slide. So now I'll stop. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. The scope of the study really was just looking at, you know, the cost of inaction and costs and benefits of solutions, but would love to um, hear from others in the room that now offline at a, at a later date about where we can go from here, the use of this, maybe future questions you'd like to see investigated. I think that this assessment is a good example of TNC's approach to working with partners. We are a science-based organization. We're here as a resource. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, open it up. Um, and I'm sure I don't know if it's uh, appropriate to have questions at this point, I'll, but I'll stop. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, so questions. Um, do we have any questions from those in the room? Okay, any questions from those online?
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number eight. It's the request for future agenda items, uh, topics or issues of interest uh, to the committee can be requested for consideration at a future meeting. Um, so are there any requests by membership for an item on a future agenda? And I will pause a moment in case there's anyone online looking for the mute button. Okay, hearing none. Um, our next committee meeting is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, May 26, 2022. And business is now concluded. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Christina Hoppus will motion to adjourn the meeting from the city of Tempe. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. You too. Bye-bye.